Then one day, all of a sudden, it had happened. There it was in the newspaper. I felt so really joyful about this that uh, I, I didn't care what they might do to me. You know, because they could, really couldn't do anything to me. You know, they could put me in jail, but what? I, I could still thumb my nose at them because there's no way they could go back and undo the Pentagon Papers. I arrived in Vietnam in February of 1965, about the same time that uh, the United States began its systematic bombing of North Vietnam. My job there was to uh, administer, train, supervise uh, teams of Vietnamese interviewers. I'd been shot at by Viet Cong. I'd seen Viet Cong hundreds of yards away, or a hundred yards away, but I never met one, and almost no American ever had. So he'd seen a side of that war in a way that almost no other American experienced. I saw a great deal of evidence of torture of prisoners, and <clears throat> often we would go to a prison and the jailkeeper would bring us someone and he, that he would say was very dangerous and he'd have him handcuffed and blindfolded. One of the first interviews I did right after I got there, I never will forget that they had tortured him real bad and I remember he said they had hung him up by his thumbs. Well, it was very sobering because I saw that the uh, person could be broken badly. We did a report on Agent Orange. He did a report which was very unpopular with his boss. And third, an unforgivable report, a report exposing the universal use of torture, which of course he knew by interviewing the people who had been tortured and in he'd been places where it was going on, which he knew about. Several of the interviews were very moving, and one interview in particular, and I look back now uh, as being a real turning point in my life, actually. He recited a poem for me, which is very moving, very moving to to hear him recite this poem in, right in the middle of this uh, interrogation room in a, in a jail where I knew people had been tortured and if not killed. Uh, and he sang a song for me. And when, it, when he sang, he, he threw his head back and he sang and he was, he was in a very proud way. And it was, it was just one of those, the most moving things that ever happened to me. Uh, every time I heard him mention this, when, this man, he would always, tears would come to his eyes and he would, he would break down at the meaning this song had for him. Tony says, could you give us a sample of the poems you like best? Answer, the following is a poem that I like best. I recite it whenever I feel downhearted. <coughs> Funny, I'm, a, I'm channeling Tony here. I recite it whenever I feel downhearted and it never fails to cheer me up. War cease, peace reappear. Let, can I get some water? Let the millions of young trees sprout their leaves and stretch their limbs. Let the barren land turn into bountiful farmland. Let the poisoned crop return to life again. War cease, the deadly game let the frightening slaughter vanish. Let the farmers walk their contented feet to the paddy field. Let the paddy ears drink ecstatically the milk of the dew. War cease. Let the prisons open their gates. Let the sweet hands stroke gently the young hair. Let the people live in peace and abundance. Let the fresh smile blossom on the young lips. War cease and Benhai River 
let the millions of hearts let the millions of hearts know the joy <coughs> know the joy of reunion <clears throat> let let everybody visit all our fatherland let everybody visit all of our fatherland let the North and South enjoy the day of reunification. Well, that's, that's the poem that he heard from this guy in prison who'd been tortured and beaten heavily. Then he, then he went on to sing a song, and he, he threw his head back and he sang out, sitting there in the middle of this prison. And... That was the, the stark, the stark contradiction of the whole thing because, because the Vietnamese people are very, very beautiful people, you see. And what the United States is doing to them is, is as bad as they are beautiful.